Hey, I'm Nate Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist currently excavating in northern Texas, and I specialize in the archaeology of the indigenous peoples of North America prior to their colonization by Europeans, especially in the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. I've been working in this region for more than 10 years, so I have a fair amount of experience to draw on as I discuss these topics. But today I want to wander a little bit outside of my comfort zone and talk about a branch of archaeology that's very well developed in Eurasian archaeology, but is almost unheard of in North America. And that's the relationship between archaeology and language, what we might call historical linguistics. In North America, there's no fully developed language like we see among the Aztec and the Maya in Mesoamerica, where words are represented by symbols and combined to form full sentences. In the absence of written texts, there are only a few ways that we can talk about this subject at all. The first is reconstruction from modern indigenous languages, like families like the Muscogean, the Siouan languages, or the Iroquoian languages. Now, the Cherokee from Southern Appalachia, the Iroquois from the area around Lake Ontario, and the Tuscarora from Eastern North Carolina and Virginia are all Iroquoian languages. They're all descended from a common Proto-Iroquoian ancestral language, the same way that Italian, French, and Spanish are all descendants from Latin. So this begs the question, who were these original Proto-Iroquoians? How and when did their descendants end up in such widely diverse places and different places as Lake Ontario and to the Southern Appalachians? And one of the lines of evidence to reconstruct this history is linguistic. So looking at the vocabulary words in common between Iroquois and Cherokee, they have a lot in common, but they also have conspicuous differences. They share no vocabulary terms for anything related to the cultivation of maize crops. For an economic staple that later became so important to both groups, it's unlikely that each group would develop an entirely different vocabulary to talk about terms of the exact same practice if they had still been in intimate contact with each other when, you know, all these people started to learn maize agriculture. So it's likely that the split happened before maize agriculture ever took place in that original population. So likely sometime in the late archaic or maybe the early, or early woodland. Another line of evidence for language in the archaeological past is uh, place name analysis. Place names tend not to change very much unless there's a wholesale population replacement like we have in the colonial period. So the place names that survive in modern English are likely very, very old. A recent look at Algonquin language uh, place names from early colonial period uh, regions in the Chesapeake shows a disproportionate number of places explicitly relating to water. So talking about fishing or areas where rivers widen or convergent places where, where rivers meet or meeting places on the river, things like that. And this makes sense when we consider that the boat was the only form of transportation that was available in North America prior to the reintroduction of the horse from Europe. So this use of language shows that, at least for the Algonquin speakers of the Chesapeake, but also likely for other cultures in the Eastern Woodlands, the world was organized around more of a hydroscape than a landscape because the water is the primary mode of transportation for the entire time that people are living here, again, before the horse was introduced. So the final way to look at language is much more ephemeral, and it's really the ghosts of language that we're looking at rather than evidence of the actual language itself. And that technique is rooted in what David Anthony calls a persistent cultural frontier. Um, a frontier is a diffuse boundary where one culture grades into another. The exact line between the two might move around, ebb and flow, but it's still possible to tell when you're well within one and well within the other side of, of this boundary. To identify a frontier, you have to look at all of the archaeological information available, artifact types, site selection criteria, burial practices, food ways. You have to look at all of it. And if a regional analysis of all of it produces a sort of cultural divide that persists in more than a few hundred years, and that is key, the frontier has to persist for many, many generations in order for us to be able to say this is probably an, a language barrier. What we're looking at is two different language groups on either side of this, this frontier, this, this barrier, this divide. This is part of the basis for that two ancestries model that I talked about in the previous video.
Now, there's no good way to determine what those two language groups are, if they're Iroquoian or Siouan, say. But we can say that these two regions are occupied by speakers of different languages. We can see that process archaeologically in context where we have written verification that, yes, there were two different linguistic groups living on either side of this boundary, on the other, either side of the frontier. Um, an example of this is like the Roman Celtic border in Europe and in Britain as, you know, Romans encroach further and further in to previously Celtic speaking areas, the material culture changes. And historically, we know that those people change languages to a Romance language instead of a Celtic language. Artifacts and trade goods are able to cross these boundaries. And so you'll see trade goods from Rome showing up in the Celtic regions and trade goods from Northern Europe coming down into the Roman area. So it's not like these are um, not vile, inviolate barriers, but they are still visible. You can still tell when you're in one region and when you're in the other. This method can, but to my knowledge, has not been systematically employed by modern archaeologists working in North America. But that's for some deep-rooted and deep-end theoretical reasons that I hope I can get into later on as this channel gets more developed. As always, I hope you found that interesting. If you have any questions about this or any other subject matter related to the archaeology of North America, the Eastern Woodlands, or the Southeast, uh, feel free to drop those in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.